Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Kranti Ananta, whom I will refer to as Ananta. That's uh, her, a name that was given to her by the spiritual teacher Osho, whom most listeners will have heard of. And um, she is in Thailand as we speak, and I am in Iowa, where the temperature tomorrow is expected to go to 28 below zero centigrade. Uh, <laughs> that's with the wind chill. Uh, and I'm sure it's nothing like that in Thailand. Um, it's, no. al- it's also 10.30 at night in Iowa and 11.30 in the morning in Thailand. And we, it took us some doing to work this out. But uh, in any case, I first found out about uh, Ananta from uh, several friends. I, I, you know, A lot of people listen to these shows and I get recommendations. And, and within a span of a couple of days, somebody sent me a link to your interview with um, Alan Sternfeld. And I uh, said, you got to interview this lady. So, <laughs> so I said, all right, give me your email address. And they did, and here we are. So welcome and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, I've taken two different tacks in doing these interviews. One is to sort of do a, a kind of a chronology of the person's spiritual path, you know, with various milestones. And another is to kind of, uh, you know, have them say in a nutshell what they feel like the essence of what they like you know what their awakening is or what their what they like to teach is um how would you like to do it um we'll, we'll do both but what would you, how would you like okay it's up to me then i think we'll start yeah. with how i what i first heard about you which was that you uh had your awakening while serving time in a japanese prison which is uh <laughs> A little unusual, but not so much so. I actually know of two other people, one of whom is a good friend of mine, who awoke while in prison. One was Ed Beckley, um, who's a friend of mine who wrote a book about it um, called Dance of a Rich Yogi. He was serving time in a prison in Las Vegas, Nevada, a federal prison, and and had an awakening, which was sustained. And another was a guy named Satyam Nadim, who was in some kind of horrible... Oh, I know You know him? Nadim. Yeah, he was in some pr- yeah. prison in Miami or something. Uh, <laughs> horrible food, incredibly hot, and yet <laughs> had, this, had this awakening. And it, it almost seems that in both, in both cases, and in your case, from what I've heard of your story, that those circumstances were somehow conducive uh, to the awakening that occurred. Uh, would you agree? Yes. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say what if, you know, but I mean, do you sort of feel like if you had been in more, um, you know, pleasant circumstances, you might not have been forced into the the shift that took place? Uh, who knows? Yeah, yeah. You know, who knows? But I only know that um, before that happened, there was such a strong, strong calling in me for silence, for truth, for really clarity. This calling was so strong that when it actually happened that the handcuffs went around my wrist, hmm. I knew in that moment, it's like there was a huge, my whole body started shaking and, and there was of course like, no! Hmm. And in the same moment there was a knowing that this is it. Hmm. This is what I've, I've been waiting for. Huh. I knew that you mean when you were originally incarcerated at, at, at that at, in, in, initially? In the, very, in the very first moment that the handcuffs went on, hmm. it was like the, the mind completely stopped. And of course there was the, the shaking of the identity, like and an absolute screaming inside. Yeah. And the mind was completely stopped, and in the same moment there was a knowing that this was absolutely right. Hmm. But, absolutely but right. But that wasn't your awakening then and there. That was because oh, you went oh, through a lot of. But when, yeah. Absolutely, I, I went through a, a lot of extreme suffering following that moment. Hmm. But in the same time, when I look back now, at the same time that all the suffering was there, there was also a deeper um, clarity or knowing. It was like I was tasting from the very beginning the part that was free, hmm. but it wasn't bigger than the part that was suffering, you know? Right. The suffering part had the upper hand. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. For, for quite a long time, about a year, I would say. Hmm. 
And of course, I mean, this, th these weren't new notions to you. It's not like you, you were a spiritual neophyte. You, you had been with, in Osho's ashram for t 10 years or some such yeah. thing. So, I mean, it sounds like you've yeah. been seeking since you were a teenager, really. Yeah, I mean, when, when I look back, although it wasn't like consci conscious seeking, mm -hmm. it wasn't um, a conscious search, I can see that I was seeking right from being a little girl. Yeah. You know, like many, many people, it was like that. And because we don't know, it's like we search in all the wrong places, but of course it's always, it's like a process of elimination. Yeah. So... Yeah, I looked everywhere for, for freedom. Mm -hmm. I, I recall like being very young, about nine, ten years old, and wondering like, who made the rules, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, who made the, I, I was being told that I had to go to school and I had to do this and I had to, and I was like, who made the rules? Mm. You know, I really wanted to know, you know, my mother would say, it's the law, you have to go because it's the law. <laughs> and I said, but, Whose law? Where did the law come from? And this question was like I wanted to be free. And I started searching freedom in all those places where I thought freedom might be. And, you know, in the beginning I thought that doing what I want was freedom. Right. So I just did what I want and broke all the rules. Right. And <laughs> And then I thought that um, getting lots of money and having loads of money was freedom mm -hmm. or would make me happy. And then I got into uh, various situations that brought a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent some years with a very, very rich billionaire mm -hmm. man wow. and uh, went living the high life. And uh, in that I got into drugs. Oh. Huh. And I started searching, you know, it's like drugs was another doorway of of going to another reality. Right. It was with him that I started that. <clears throat> and uh, Hallucinogens. That, uh, yeah, and also everything, mm. everything. You know, with that man, he was, he was very, very rich and money was no limitation. Mm -hmm. And he was into cocaine and I got into that. Uh-huh. Did you sort and, of have uh, some sort of rationalization that, that, that doing cocaine was enhancing your spiritual awareness, or was it just like you're doing it for, no, 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 doing no, it for no, kicks? Think about breaking the rules. And trying. Yeah. I was just trying everything. You were just doing I was stuff. just. Yeah, right. yeah. And um, then it, it moved on to harder drugs, it moved on to heroin also. Mm. And from the moment that started, I knew something in me deep, deep knew that this has to end, this is not, you know, there's so much money, there's so much material, it's like, this is not it, this is just not it. And I knew that I had to leave him and leave this, the world I was in with him, mm -hmm. and search. And that that's when the search became conscious, really, because yeah. then I knew, I knew that it wasn't material what I was looking for. Yeah. I was kind of done with that. You know? I went through a similar thing, and but I compacted it into about a year, <laughs> and w without all the money. But uh, you know, it, it actually there there was a bit of heroin involved toward the very end, just a little experimentation, okay. and then I just kind of think, no, this isn't gonna take me where I want to go. So, but um, yeah, that's how me. Yeah, were you still in the but, UK at uh, this point, or were you like all over the world? I was, yeah, but yeah. I was living in in Spain. I met this man in Spain. Mm -hmm. I left England when I was about nineteen. I see. And just went like, I'm just going to go, you know, I, I looked out at the horizon and I just saw forever yeah. there. Uh -huh. And I just wanted to go there. Yeah. It was like, a, and if I look back now, it's like I saw the eternal. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to go to the eternal, you know, I couldn't see any end. And I just didn't like this, um, this life that was showing itself, like when I looked at my parents and like the society of getting a job and getting married and making the money and having kids and right. you know get a nice house and this it can't be about that mm -hmm. that was my my vision from very very young it's like it can't be this not this whole miracle of what we are like all of this mm -hmm. just for that right. how can it be so i wanted to know what was really behind it all yeah and 
Yeah. Continue. That's okay. So I tried all this stuff, and um, then I knew, like, I went into a deep depression when I had to leave this man, mm. and all life that went with it. Mm -hmm. And um, in that depression was born the conscious um, awareness that what I was searching for was inside of me, or huh. it was not out there. How, so I was about 26. 26. How did the depression trigger that? You just somehow realized it on your own, or did it did it spur you to kind of start reading spiritual books or some such thing? Well, I, actually, many years before that, I started reading Krishnamurti, but okay. I didn't understand the word. <laughs> but I was pulled. To it, yeah. Know? And also, I yoga and these things. Mm. Like I, I started. Um, uh, always, if I look back, always I was looking for the deeper meaning of everything. Mm -hmm. So then at around 26, I, I knew that I had to go far away from everything I knew. That was the feeling. Yeah. And I came to Thailand. Huh. Well, so you've been in Thailand quite a while. Nearly 22 years. Huh. Amazing. But not like constantly. I came to, that, to Thailand and I looked out at the horizon right. again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, it was as if, like, now I was sitting on the other side of what I saw when I looked out in Spain, mm -hmm. which was a feeling. It was like, oh, here I am. And, and I knew in that moment that I wouldn't go back to UK. Mm. And um, somebody told me that I could uh, survive and make my living in Japan. Mm. So off I went to Japan. No. Didn't the Osho thing happen before Japan? No. First I went to Japan oh, I see. Okay. and then yeah. I met somebody. Okay. I met somebody who gave me a book of Osho. Right. I was in Japan about seven years on and off. Mm -hmm. Did you learn the language? So, uh, uh, when I got locked up I had to because um, oh. you're not allowed to speak anyway. Oh, I see. But when you do speak to the guards or whatever, it must be Japanese. Uh -huh. So, and I couldn't speak Japanese, so I had to learn. Interesting. So, uh, okay, so you're in and out of Japan, and uh, but then somehow you ended up living in Osho's ashram for quite some time, as I gather. Yeah, it was like once I got into Japan, this feeling of depression that was like underneath everything. Mm -hmm. Like I was having a good time on the surface. Mm. You know, I was enjoying all the beauty of the ocean and the play and the parties and all these things. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. deep inside me was like something's just not complete. Yeah. Something's just clear. And somebody gave me a book of Osho. Mm -hmm. And I read, like, I've read the first chapter and my whole body started um, responding. Hmm. And I knew I'm going to Pune. Interesting. How did you, how, in what way did your body start responding? Like uh, everything came totally present, mm -hmm. and like, <clears throat> and knowing that this is where I need to go, mm -hmm. this is this is it. Like he's speaking, the words he's speaking is is the deepest truth inside of me. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I'd really heard what I call truth. <clears throat> so and obviously, um, obviously yeah. it resonated with you a lot better than Krishna Murthy yeah. had, right? He was a little yes, obtuse, was, Krishnamurti. He was a little hard to <laughs> follow. Yeah, quite serious for me at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that I mean, now... And, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so when you got to uh, um, India, Osho was still alive at that point. You so. No, oh, at okay. the time that I, I read this book mm -hmm. and I started my journey towards Pune, mm -hmm. he left the body. Oh, I see. While I was on the way to Pune, I got the news hmm. that he just left the body and all the sannyasins were going crazy. Uh, so instead, I went to walk in the Himalayas ah. in silence for three months by myself. Just trekking around? Yeah, and still like not wanting to have contact with anybody, like really just coming hmm. more and more inside, inside, inside. And then I ended up in a in a monastery, like for a ten day silent retreat. Up in the Himalayas. And yeah, in in Kathmandu actually. Oh. And um, that was the first conscious glimpse 
that what I was and confirmation that what I was looking for was right here. Hmm. Were you up in the Nepalese Himalayas mostly, or or Indian Himalayas? Nepalese. Ah, okay. So you yeah. weren't like up in Uttarakhand and places like that. You were more up in Nepal, hiking around. So you, you probably yeah. weren't, you probably weren't running into a lot of yogis and and so on up in Nepal so much. I right? wasn't. You, you were looking I for was them, very. I, I wasn't interested in talking to anybody. In fact, I had an hmm. aversion to hmm. to speaking to anybody who wanted to know my name or where I was from or my story or any wow. of this. I was just like, you know, stay away. You know, I just was with this. It's interesting yeah. because you know a lot of people go through teenage rebellion. But um, you seem to have sustained a very independent attitude. You know, I mean, a lot of the old hippies, radical, you know, <laughs> hi radical guys from the '60s, end up ended up becoming stockbrokers and conservatives and whatnot. And uh, yeah. you know, you seem to have kind of managed to keep your fire lit, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this this went on until I was in jail, and mm. my whole life changed after that. Mm. Yeah. So, what um, is it worth a? Uh, Elaborating on the uh, the uh, monastery in, in Kathmandu at all in terms was that significant for not you? Or? Really. Not really. Not a big deal. Yeah. No. Okay. And apparently you were still dabbling in drugs, or at least you got back into dabbling in them because that's how you ended up in jail, right? Yeah, I was in and out. You know, I mm -hmm. started searching healing. I wanted to. Um, when I first went to the commune to Osho's commune, which was the following year, um, I started uh, getting into intensive awareness groups. Hmm. And that was where I first tasted the first experience of like, wow, this is, you know, the only way that my mind could relate to that was that this is where you go on LSD. Uh -huh, yeah. You know, this expanded awareness. Right was, ah, this is what I get on the LSD. So then I became aware that I didn't need the, the drugs right. to go to so-called this place. But that certainly that so wasn't the I, first uh, time you had been exposed to that notion. I mean, if you've been reading any sort of spiritual books, you must have realized that that's what all these yogis and whatnot are trying I'd to... I'd realized it here in the head, right. but yeah. I was totally tripping, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I this like intensive awareness, enlightenment in intensive who is in mm -hmm. for four or five days and um, all that was left was was that was pure awareness that was all that was left and I was speaking out of that right and that was that was the experience I had on the LSD which was just an experience that came and went always yeah but this was like, it was here it was clear it was no confusion yeah it was natural and, mm -hmm. yeah so although I'd read about it I'd never experienced it so then this was like confirmation like here it is here it is and Osho was was speaking his expressing truth through his way and I was tasting 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 the truth of that mm -hmm. you know but still there was a lot of confusion right about so called enlightenment you know I mean I wasn't even concerned about enlightenment I was never trying to become enlightened it wasn't my thing you know, I wanted to, to get uh, freedom, freedom, mm -hmm. freedom. And of course, I mean, enlightenment can be defined as a state of freedom, but I don't suppose that that's, yes. not, that's not what the word that, that uh, implied for you. Really, just, yeah. Right. Uh, it wasn't really like I'm, I'm searching to get enlightened. This was never. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, during all this period, this this burning desire for freedom indicates that you must have really felt trapped or constrained or, or in some way not free. Well, I was carrying all this, uh, you know, I was carrying... This. One of the things I, I said recently to myself was, you know, I run so far away from mm -hmm. my roots mm -hmm. and I couldn't run far enough mm -hmm. because it was all inside of me. Yeah. You know, everything I tried to run from, like the family atmosphere, which was dysfunctional, mm -hmm. dysfunctional, and everything I tried to run away from, like, was still all somewhere sitting inside of me, even if um, I found I had great experiences and, you know, I, I knew another, another taste of life, mm. still there was, like, it was always underlying this um, 
what I was wanting to get away from. Right. In other words, you're still carrying all your baggage. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, okay, so you had this experience in Osho's Ashram, five days of pure consciousness. I had many, many experiences there, you know, screaming, shouting, going crazy, mm -hmm. celebrating, right. coming like to totally in love with life in every way, mm -hmm. learning lots of thing things, um, uh, learning body work, meeting people in love constantly, and mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it was just extraordinary. How long were you there? Amazing. Over a period of about ten years. That's a long time. P pretty much. But it was only. I'm it sorry, was only two years later that I was in jail. Right. I was only in two years, and then I was in jail. Okay, so. Because it was like I, I had one one foot in, uh, still in the, the scene with all the friends who were connected to drugs and parties, mm. and another foot was into this healing cleaning, pure vibration. Interesting. I was kind of torn between the two. So you're yeah. kind of oscillating between them, sort of plunging yeah. into this and I, then going back to that. And, yeah. yeah, 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 like an old habit. Right, right. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So obviously you would have to leave Pune to go back to the drug friends, right? They weren't there. They, they, Whenever I left Pune, that was the circle of friends I was in. Mm, interesting. You know? Yeah, my father, mm -hmm. when I got into meditation, I, my father was an alcoholic, and I would get him to go to meditation. We, he, he started meditating at a certain point because he saw how much good it was doing me, and I got him, I'd get, get him to go to you know, retreats and, I, and all, and he'd, he'd feel great in the retreats, and then he'd come home and start drinking again, and he said he just couldn't sustain it because you know, the habit was, so, yeah. habit was so powerful. Yeah, and, and also the, the circumstances that go with the habit. Right. You know, the vibration of the people, the crowd. Yeah, the peer pressure, that, the like, whole social scene. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you're so you're in one of your flings in Japan, <laughs> away from the ashram, uh, getting your yayas out, and uh, and you got busted, right? I, I was just about to go totally wild again. Huh. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and this time that I got busted, it, it wasn't... Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that I was 100% innocent, but I wasn't guilty either. You know, it happened that somebody was passing through mm -hmm. Tokyo and they left something with me ah, yeah. huh? in my apartment. And it, it was only there a few days mm -hmm. and I was raided. Yeah, interesting. Uh, but I knew, you know, it was for me. It wasn't about the story around it. It was really... Like the screaming inside of me so deeply for silence, for peace, hmm. for clarity was stronger than all the play of of uh, life. Yeah. Yeah. So when you got, uh, J Japan seems to be rather aggressive about busting people. Paul McCartney got busted over there and, and when he arrived to do a tour and had to leave the country. But uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> They're pretty uh, yeah. zen. It's a very zen experience. Huh. So so hard. They are, they are so hard. It's you know in the beginning it's like how is this human? How is this um, you know? It's like against human rights. This was my whole in thing other, in, in the beginning. In other words, they're so harsh the way they treated you. You're saying. Yeah. yeah. So strict, like concentration camp. Wow. So you but, so you ended up in this prison, but, and you and you had this recognition as you were getting busted that. Somehow this was, you know, God's hand at play here, you know, delivering whatever you needed to experience. Uh, but Absolutely. from what, recount for us a little bit about what it was like in the prison um, pre-awakening. I mean, what was your daily routine and how did you cope with it? <laughs> daily routine. Mm -hmm. Well, I was solitary confined. Mm. Um, and uh, so I would be picked up at 6.30 in the morning. Why were you solitary and take, confined? Were you like a troublemaker or something? Are they giving you special treatment? No, or? no, <laughs> no, I um, actually, when I first was locked up, I was put in with seven, seven who were Japanese or mm -hmm. different uh, Chinese or mm -hmm. whatever. And they're all speaking at the same time. And, and I always just felt like I'll go mad, I'll mm -hmm. go mad. And I asked somebody, like, what are those rooms up there? Mm -hmm. It was single rooms. And she, she said, for, for one alone, mm -hmm. in Japanese. Mm -hmm. I said, how do you go there? And she mm -hmm. said, if you're crazy. Ah. So I said, uh-huh. Ah! 
and I started screaming. <laughs> oh, that's great. So they locked you up. I the power I was in there. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> and they kept and you there so throughout. Uh, they kept me there, yeah. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> okay, so they picked so you up at 6.30 in the morning out of your little cell. And they took me to a factory. Mm -hmm. On, a, on a location or you, they bust you off to some factory? No, 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 no. You had about... This was the only chance you got to use the legs and walk. Oh. It was about a seven or eight minute walk mm -hmm. to the factory, along with like uh, I don't know how many others. Mm -hmm. They're all marching, you know. And you you will march to the factory and you go in there. You start at seven seven thirty mm -hmm. and um, put on a machine to work. Huh. And the whole thing is in silence. Mm -hmm. And um, I was the only Westerner. Um, in the beginning, towards the end, one or two more came. Was there any attempt by your parents or by the British consulate or anything to get you out of there, or were you just pretty much left to your own devices? No, I mean, it was in the beginning, you know, friends were trying to get lawyers and this and this and this, and I just knew it's like, you know, stop it, you know, this is, this is what is, this is hmm. what has to be, okay. you know. And there was a struggle inside of me, like all the time, when is this going to be over, and struggling off the mind, but there was a knowing that, yeah. you know, this is, this is it, this is the turning point of my life. Interesting. And you didn't know when it was going to be, I mean, they didn't tell you, okay, it's going to be three years or whatever, you just were in there and you had no idea when you were no, going to they, out, right? No, you get like a sentence, mm -hmm. but then you you can, on good behavior, get out by sixty percent of that sentence if you're if you're really good. And, so what, and I got out on fifty-five percent. Even though you were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was totally sane. Totally. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you're working on the machine. What time did you finish each day? About five. Hmm. So a pretty long day doing some monotonous work. Yeah, working on a machine, and everything is in silence. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's it's really amazing place. You know, you get counted about five or six times a day, mm -hmm. and you have to stand to attention and make all these moves with your head, and mm. like it's it's just real complete madness. It looked to me when I first arrived, and yeah. I and I thought like, okay, they are joking. You know, this is going to be for the first two weeks, huh. and then they'll put me somewhere else. I was sure about that, you know, but uh, no, that was it. Huh. The Japanese and, are tough. Yeah. I mean, if you ever heard of the Bataan Death March during World War II, they, they were uh, they were intense, those dudes. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, but it's at but the I same must time. Say, without yeah. that, go ahead. Without intensity and that strictness. Mm -hmm. The same experience wouldn't be there, of course, you know. Yeah, and it seemed like even when you were in the midst of this, uh, you felt that there was some kind of wisdom inherent in the situation. Well, I started to become aware. I started to become aware of um, what was free to smile. What do you mean? You know, like everything had been taken away. Mm -hmm. yeah, they were... Right. I, I could have some Osho books, mm -hmm. which I was reading. Um, everything was taken away, <clears throat> but they couldn't take the smile. Right, yeah. And they, that this couldn't be taken. Huh. And, and it was like I'd found something that that couldn't be taken no matter what. Yeah, like you you were, they couldn't rob you of your own inner happiness. So you were saying that <coughs> um, you were kind of forced into... It was a great gift. Yeah, not many people would have seen it that way, but you did, and it, it's sort of the—it's almost like the lack of any sort of external gratification forced you into finding kind of inner fulfillment, right? And would it be correct to say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah absolutely. And yet, you know, when I listened to your interview with Alan Sternfeld, I got the impression that it was really quite hellish, nonetheless. I mean, it was no picnic, and and you really were f feeling like, you know. Tremendous, Absolutely. Tremendously trapped and constrained all the while. In the, in the first half of my time there, it was like that. It was the only time ever in my life I wanted to die, you know. Mm, yeah. But um, the second half, it was quite blissful. Hmm. The same experience, you know. Yeah. 
And that's because some sort of shift, second, a shift took was, place or and, a realization. Yeah, yeah. And it was so, you know, now there are moments when I feel like, oh, I was so special to be there in that, in that little cell, all having so much space just to open up as myself. And mm. it was really a special time. I got absolutely no regret about that or any other moment in the whole of life, you know. Mm. It's just all yeah. so much gratitude for everything. That's great. Mm. So talk about the time or the point during your incarceration when you actually sort of woke up and had the shift. Well, well I wouldn't say that it was one moment, oh, really? you know. I mean, I described that moment with Alan, like mm -hmm. when I just surrendered. It was like an exhaustion, actually. I was just so exhausted with trying to have a better experience of life mm -hmm. and my mind was just so busy all the time about this and that and you know if you don't speak it all goes on inside right so it was just like cooking you know mm. and my mind was just so busy with when I would get out of there and all of this constant madness in mm -hmm. the mind and um, one day I was just exhausted mm -hmm. I couldn't just totally exhausted, physically, mentally, emotionally, and I just laid back and there was like a giving up. Mm. And as I described it with Alan, you know, it was like I, as I started to just let go and relax, then I could really, really feel the pain. Mm. Because all the time you're, you're, you're tense, you don't really feel the pain. Right. But once I really relaxed, and it was excruciating, it was so strong, but on all levels, you know, like physically, emotionally, mentally, it was so extreme. And I, I saw the point, like just to just fall into it. Hmm. I didn't think of this, it just, I just started falling into it. And I'd done a lot of, um, at, at the, in, Puna, I had done a lot of um, body work mm -hmm. uh, and especially cranial sacral and I knew my inner um, landscape of, of the experience inside the body so I just started like breathing into the pain mm -hmm. and it was like the body started unwinding huh. itself and it was very very painful to, to feel it but this just like feeling of surrender into it, into it, into it, into it, started to bring a sweet release. Hmm. And I just continued for hours, I don't know how many hours, but hours in this sweet releasing, sweet releasing, and falling and dropping. And, and then, to, to my surprise, you know, came a moment where everything just opened. Hmm where there was no more a body anyway. There was no more experience of a body in pain or of a mind in pain or, or of any emotions. It was just a complete openness. Huh. And it just kept opening and opening and, and a feeling of um, of bliss. It was just pure, pure, pure. It's like It's like everything was just... But it wasn't like a shape of a body, it was, I was everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a thought appeared in, the, in that moment, like, what is this? Like, wow. And I just let go more into it, and more into it, and more into it. And there was just only pure love, pure freedom, pure beauty, pure... Like the whole ocean of existence, huh. and I was uh, not separate to that. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. I'm just listening. And um, <laughs> I don't remember. I don't. Yeah, I don't remember. Um, like immediately after that, exact moments like this, because it was like I didn't think like, oh, this is whatever. I just was like, wow, here's a doorway. Mm. You know. And um, the next day I went to the factory and nothing was bothering me. 
nothing. My mind had stopped running with all those concerns of tomorrow. I was just only like, you know, I remember seeing a a, a bird fly across the sky, and and I I was flying. And um, everywhere I looked, I saw the beauty, the beauty of the chilling cold, the frozen fingers on the machine and trying to get the fingers warm under the light of the sewing machine and the beauty of it all, you know, and the joke of it all, hmm. like seeing that this is, this, is, this is just a picture show. Yeah. And that night I went back and instead of reading my books, I, I dropped again to that that place I called it and this started happening on a daily basis and more and more opening and tears you know I cried and cried and cried but they were not tears of suffering right they were just like the the soul the soul cleaning mm -hmm. and yeah I mean I didn't notice it so much in those moments but when I I look back later I could see that all my my mind was changing, my vision was changing, everything was changing. It's interesting, and you weren't actually doing any particular spiritual practices. You were just going to the factory and going back to your room, and it just started. Well, I was totally. You had to be totally one hundred percent present, twenty four yeah. hours, because you were being watched. Right. You know. You were being watched. And any move you made could be breaking the rules, mm. and you don't know because you don't know all the rules, right? Mm. <laughs> and um, so you had to be 100% total present always. Mm -hmm. Did this just become a nightly occurrence from then from then on? As dive, sort of this deep diving deep and it was constant, constant, 24/7. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was. Um, yeah, well, the 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 dropping into that ocean of whatever. Mm -hmm was um, every night because I didn't sleep. I was lucid dreaming. Ah, so you sleep. were sort of uh, awake and, uh, in, in, during the night, throughout the night, dropping into yeah, this unboundedness. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. And then in the day, everything changed. I just was, was feeling the, the, the blessing of everything, the beauty. I could understand everything in the life hmm. that had lived until that moment. I felt compassion for everybody. Hmm. The, you know, like, and um, I forgave everybody, huh. and um, yeah, I mean, it was a period of time that was, yeah, it was really all of that. But I wouldn't say that that's the state that n that does or needs to stay. It's just a state, like all, all right. states right. that come and go. You know, like it's not like the now. I, I don't need to feel the ocean of existence in bliss or whatever because mm -hmm. it's just every moment is it no matter how the moment appears right you know it's not um, that was just like a an opening yeah and and there've been many openings since then yeah many mm -hmm. and layers of you know because following that in, in that in that period of time um, i was mostly standing as awareness because I, I wasn't uh, relating in the world so I didn't have the identity touched and triggered like the ego was not being triggered in relationships mm -hmm. or anywhere so um, most of my uh, experience was of just being awareness and uh, when I came back into into the world mm -hmm. Of course, everything started arising because the relation, relating in the world started, yeah. and buttons getting pushed, More and the personality situations. started. You know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, life, life mm -hmm. happening, normal, normal, normal life, and um, you know, I I had massive confusion following that because how could all all that be? You know, people tied up in all their useless stories and talking a lot of rubbish that was my vision in that moment how could that be part of this hmm. you know I just couldn't uh, there was no integration interesting so the you had sort uh, of and uh, my personality you had integrated the prison into started that. Um, having I was gonna say you, you had somehow mm. integrated prison experience into that because, I wanted because to go of it back. 
Right, because it was so simple and routine and, and uncomplicated. Right? I mean, whereas outside the prison, it got messy. You had to deal with all, yeah. the, all the complaints. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there were lots of triggers coming in. in the... well, I had to listen to everybody's uh, nonsense, you yeah. know. In there, nobody was talking. <laughs> so when I came out, it was expected that you go into the social thing and start talking all this useless bubbler, which I, I had seen the mind. I had, you know, we were given five minutes a day to speak. Mm. From Monday to Friday, we could speak for five minutes. Wow. And, you know, what can be said in that five minutes that's of any importance? So at the hour leading up to that five minutes, I would be like going, okay, that's not important, that's not important, that's not important, mm. that's not important. So I was seeing that nothing was actually important huh. to to speak, and then speaking happened out of out of that seeing. And um, so when I came out, everywhere I was surrounded by was non nonsense as far as I could see or hear, and I didn't want to be part of it. So I had a big resistance hmm. to coming back into that play. So how did you mm. overcome that resistance? How did you finally integrate it? Well. Um, um, I, I, again, there was suffering mm -hmm. because this uh, I didn't want this this social scene. I didn't want to mix with people. I didn't want to, you know. I was so deep that there was nobody I could speak to at that level. Mm -hmm. And what's the point, you know? I just went into this kind of um, depressive feeling again, and would kind of like to go back to the jail, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And I stayed a few months um, in my father's house, you know, staying a lot by myself and slowly, slowly, slowly starting to mm, feel the re the um, accept the re reality that I'd come back to because I was imagining that coming back was going to be the greatest mm, thing. Yeah. And it was a downer. So. So within a few months, I went back to Thailand, mm -hmm. and um, this was just fantastic all over again. And within a couple of months, I was back in Pune, mm -hmm. and then I started a whole uh, deep deconditioning tra training through body work. Ah. So, um, uh, Osho rebalancing. Right. So they have a specific uh, practice for that to to sort of decondition yourself. Is it? Well, it was, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's like emotionally releasing everything from the body, and you're you're learning how to work on other bodies to release the emotions. Hmm. And it's a ten hour a day course for four months. Wow. And uh, so while, while you're learning, yeah, rolfing, all this kind of stuff. Hmm. So and how did what, combined what did that do for you over four months? Well, it gave me the chance to really scream everything out mm -hmm. and let the body express everything it was holding, mm -hmm. you know, because the body was carrying the story. Yeah. And so I could scream and let the body free up. Mm -hmm. You know, my voice was so small that I couldn't really speak mm -hmm. much. And, um, well, you can see that that's changed. <laughs> and, um, yeah, just, just to come back into expression in all the ways and to, to start bringing joy back into the body hmm. and learning how to, um, it was a very, uh, it's a very deep body work where you're working on, on, on other bodies. You have to be totally present and totally sensitive and you work to release the bodies. Hmm. So, I was training in that. That would become my work. Oh. Is it still? Which it did. You still do that? No, I did that for some years. Mm -hmm. And um, there came a point after a few years where I started to see that even if people got free of their emotional, even if they were able to emotionally release, mm -hmm. for as long as they were still continuing that the emotions are happening, to a me mm -hmm. and that they are believing in this me story for as long as that is going on 
there's still no real freedom. Even if even if they could scream and shout and let go of the emotion, mm. still they were identified with somebody. <clears throat> so, and so, did you start studying? The work started uh, to change. Did you start studying Advaita or something? Is that how you came to the realization that? No, 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 no. I, I, Started, actually, I started to see a lot of things in the ashram where I saw the limitation, mm -hmm. where I saw that identification was was all there, holding people in suffering. Mm -hmm. I started to see that uh, the limitation in the ashram, and that it wasn't for me anymore. Mm -hmm. This started to become obvious. Okay. That it was over. Yeah. That all the groups and all the workshops and all the everything that it was it was just over. Mm -hmm. And um, in the same time, I heard about Dolano. She gives um, t uh, intensives every month in Pune. Uh -huh. And at that time, I was struggling in a in a relationship mm -hmm. with a with a man, and that was bringing up all the drama that was still left in the body. Right. And that is the system, you know, it always is there in the system until it's really met. Yeah, it's interesting how you keep referring to... And so, to although the, I had this, like, open... I was just saying, it's interesting how, how you keep referring to the body, because it's my understanding, too, that all this stuff, psychological or emotional, has a physiological counterpart. And it seems that um, what you were doing was yes. was working on on that level in order, to, you know, rather than just sort of working on the more abstract mental or emo or emotional levels, working on the physical level in order to kind of root out the the physical foundation yes. of these things. But at the same time, the emotional was being worked on, and also the psychological. Right. So all levels at once. But for as long as there's any identification. Yeah, I mean, now my, my vision is totally different, but at that time, mm -hmm. that was what was appropriate. Huh. And, um. So was this. Then I, then I went to. Uh, Delano. Yeah. Was Delano a no show yeah, graduate went, or something? Yes. Is that why she was in Pune? Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. She, she had, um, woken up and she was giving, um, it, she was, it actually, I'd never, at that time, there were not like awakened beings like there are now, so-called awakened beings. Like now, there's so much satsang happening. Mm -hmm. There's so many people awakening to who they really are. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like that in, the, in that day. Huh. I couldn't easily just meet somebody else who knew what I was talking about. Right. Now it would be possible, mm -hmm. but then it wasn't. Hmm. And so my experience could not be related to any anybody right. outside, so it was all within me. But Delana was one such and, person. And, um, I, yeah, she was given intensives, she was so-called uh, enlightened Zen master, that's what she calls herself, mm -hmm. and um, I went there, and from the very first talk, from the very first um, session, what she made clear in that session was it, then I became aware that what had happened in the jail was this shift. Mm, I see. And what changed for me in that moment was when I was in the jail, I was experiencing all of that, but I was still feeling myself as somebody knowing truth. Mm -hmm. As somebody who is experiencing truth. And in that meeting with her on the first session, that changed into I am that. Mm. So there was no longer this somebody who is knowing truth. It was just only that. Huh. And it was a real experiential shift. It wasn't just sort of, oh, okay, now I, oh, I get this idea. No, 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 no. That, a complete stopping of the mind. Mm. And the mind, the mind stopped, I don't know, six, seven hours, something like that. And in that stop, seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing everything passing through seeing clarification 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 hmm. knowing what had really happened in the jail like everything just started to fall into place so it was like a a, a, a huge relief of of now seeing really what 
needed to be seen for this freedom of this separation between personality and this um, experience of freedom. Mm. Before that moment, there was still a separation, like a going into the experience of freedom and going back to the experience of personality, like they were two separate experiences. Right. Whereas in that moment, it all shifted. And became simultaneous. There's nothing else but that. Right. Yes. But I will say also, because in that very moment, I was having in an extreme, um, and my life has been extreme, right? Um, in that moment, I was having extreme relationship difficulties. <laughs> and um, in in the very moment, he was also in the intensive, and he turned around like, uh, well, her teaching was like the investigation of love, that you are love. And he turned around and said, well, if I am love, I don't need you. And he just like... <laughs> pushed me away and we were living together ah. and that triggered all the drama mm. all the reaction of all the drama came up mm -hmm. in the same moment of this recognition mm. in the very same moment came all the triggers of the little me and so this gave me the the opportunity to really start investigating and clarifying what is really true and to be able to meet that that was being touched in a new way huh. from the point of freedom. So you know, what you're saying is that your boyfriend kind of walking out on you gave you that opportunity in the context of that awakening that you just had with Delano. Yes, and he didn't walk out, he stayed oh, okay. with, this, with that experience. So it was a constant, a constant, a constant Thing. I mean, we were living in a place that was very close, and so it was a constant trigger. Hmm. And that gave me the opportunity to investigate everything that was arising in, in this personality, mm -hmm. to really investigate that in a new way, and to meet it finally, to meet those sensations hmm. as a sensation being touched in awareness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Knowing, like, all the way that checking and seeing that this that is aware is is absolutely free to experience this it it doesn't change it doesn't get lost it's not hurt and it is free to just meet this experience as a wave arising hmm. and falling without energizing the poor me story of he shouldn't this this was happening in the mind and the cutting of that story and the coming back into the experience was the shift. Mm -hmm. So things were kind of unraveling in a way, it seems like. I mean, you know, the, the sort of intense identi yes. the identification with the story was getting un undone. Uh, yes. The, 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 the recognition opening into who really am I and the clarification of that was and the story getting triggered, both were as strong as each other in the same moment. Yeah. And, I would, and this went on for a period of months. Mm. And I would suggest that, uh, and we'll see what you say about this, but I would suggest that the they weren't unrelated. I mean, obviously the awakening that was taking place in consciousness was facilitating this unraveling of all the, the, per the personality stuff no mistake. and and conversely the, the unraveling of the personality stuff was necessary in order for the awakening in consciousness Absolutely. to be you know matured Absolutely. and stable this is the integration of yeah yes and in it, it the way I say it now is that it all it all comes home for truth mm -hmm. it's all coming home for truth it wants to be free, and so it all arises. Once this recognition is here, then everything that's not free in the system will come for this clarification. Yeah, you're not going to be allowed to carry all that all that garbage in the midst. No, of it. you're not. Otherwise, the recognition stays here. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It's not embodied. Right, right, right. And uh, so, did yeah. it eventually finally kind of taper off? 
uh, <laughs> you know. It settled down. It was, it was like um, what what I say about it now is like it was the me story. Like you got the a fan going mm -hmm. around, and you turn off the switch, the fan just doesn't stop immediately. It takes a while to slow down. Yeah. And the story of me in my mind was was the story of other. You know, any story of of somebody else is a me story, mm -hmm. basically. So the me story was going on about him, mm -hmm. which was of course all about me. Right. And this me was the suffering. Mm -hmm. This me was the pain, not anything he was doing. Right. So when this when this got clear, and I I stopped allowing any energy to to, to go in this me story. Mm -hmm. Like the moment I could see it starting, I would cut the en energizing that and come back to being present to the sensation. Do you still do that or does it no longer try so to start anymore? Yes, that's automatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Life is still, I mean, the me story, it's like it's, it's you know, I don't know how to say it clearer than that. Yeah. But um, the, tr the triggers can still happen, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the body gets like a, uh, a kind of a, a hit and the feeling of fear or whatever can be there mm -hmm. and it, it's an automatic the body knows that it this is the moment to to meet what what just wants to be free here yeah yeah you know? huh. so so uh, that's when was that this? still the, happens the Delano yeah. thing uh, what this is when 2010 oh I mean 2000 oh so Sorry. 10 years ago <laughs> 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 so what's been going on for the yeah, past decade then? Ago. Well then for a few years after that, or soon after that, as soon as I got free of this um, this story and this relationship, mm -hmm. um, I still had one question left over, mm -hmm. which I asked to Delano and I didn't get the answer that satisfied my mind, so I had to search myself. Mm -hmm. And it was the question about, well, okay, I, I recognize, I know who I am, I, I get this, I experience the freedom in that, but I still have this like pull towards relationship, mm -hmm. and I still want to have a lover. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Does it mean I'm not free, or I didn't arrive somewhere, or what does it mean? And she said to me, why you just don't dance? <laughs> what was that? And she she answered me. Yeah. She said, "Why why you don't just dance?" Did you mean that literally or what? <laughs> she said that. Yeah. Why you just don't dance? What is it? And I don't understand the get answer. Get this desire. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> <laughs> I do now. <laughs> uh, what did she mean? She meant like don't be don't be bothered with desires, just dance. Huh. But the fact is, for as long as the desire is there, it needs to be lived. Yeah. If it's, it wants to be clarified, if, if it's there, it wants it's to be there. lived. So live it, you know. Right. So I went on and yeah, it's to be lived. It's not to be denied. This is my vision. Mm -hmm. This is my my vision and my experience. So um, soon after, I met a man who was also awakened, mm -hmm. so-called awakened, what we're speaking of here. Mm -hmm. And we met in this this clear recognition of same self. Mm -hmm. And from there, we started to we had a seven-year relating, mm -hmm. during which we all the triggers of all the dream of relationship and all those things came up and we started to process and integrate all of that in this recognition hmm. and after a few years it was quite obvious that our meeting was really about um, bringing this to the world hmm. everything that we experienced in our relating was um, was like disappointment 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 hmm. the dream just couldn't be satisfied but one thing that in our relating that was always satisfied was the true meeting hmm. of who we are, beyond all that was playing. So this started to take the place 
more than anything, the dream fell away. This is all that was left. And there came a moment where, well, people were already asking. People were asking me to share my experience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'd already started to give individual sessions because through the body work I saw that the only way for people to get free was to really ask, who am I? Mm. And that started to happen during the bodywork sessions. And then slowly, slowly the bodywork fell away and people were coming just for those sessions. Mm -hmm. And soon I saw that um, these one-on-one -on -one sessions were not enough. People started asking for more. And then the relationship with Sato um, it became obvious that together we were we were offering satsang. Right. People were coming to us, and we returned to Pune and started to offer satsangs and groups where we were sharing everything that we were experiencing in our relationship, which most people can relate to mm -hmm. who still live in the world and are still in relationship. Mm -hmm. How to meet this? How to meet that? And we started sharing all that we were experiencing and very quickly it grew and people were coming and asking for more and it was like a confirmation from life that, you know, this is wanting to be shared. Mm -hmm. And what I see is, is it's very, very easy for people to wake up now, for people who have done a lot of background searching and they come really to a point of readiness. Yeah. They just need a tiny, 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 <laughs> a tiny stopping of the mind. Mm -hmm. Just a moment of really clearly, directly experiencing the truth of what they are and just being held in that for a while and, and from that moment they are able to shift. I see it over and over mm -hmm. and over. Do they do they stay shifted or it's not do they sort thing. of uh, does it is it intermittent as it was with you? Well, it's it's I I see it that people mostly I mean I've never met anybody that shifted in one moment and then never had to integrate. Right, right, right. So, um, so okay, you were. In Pune, doing this with this, so that's most the, with this guy, uh, but you're now you're in Satsang, now you're yeah, in Chiang Mai or whatever it's pronounced. Yes, we went for a few years mm -hmm. doing those groups together, mm -hmm. and then um, our relating came to an end. Mm -hmm. Full of love, full of peace, full of truth, full of gratitude, mm -hmm. and um, moved on. And I began sharing by uh, continued sharing by myself and him in his own way. And uh, the the call from life just continued. I started getting invited all around Europe and that just got and gets bigger and bigger. Hmm. And you know, the way I see it, it's like people are really with this um, extreme contrast that's happening in the world now. A lot of chaos and a lot of calling for clarity at the same time. Right. People are much more ready right. and available. And the work I, I do is really of this integration. You know, the part I, I find it very, very easily to facilitate anybody of the stopping of the mind. Mm -hmm. And that's the simple beginning. And then from there, it's really the, the integration, the, the bringing up all that's not free in their system and to, to to really meet in this truth and let that come up hmm. so that's that's the work i do now hmm. yeah that's, that's and it's a it's a great blessing i'm very grateful it is um there's a yeah. there's a delay of uh, three or four seconds um between you know you speaking and me hearing you so when i respond uh, then there's also a delay that's why we're having it's, it's a little um, hard to mm. hard to go back and forth quickly, but um, it seems like there's a, a sort of a popular notion in certain circles that you know the uh, this sort of realization of of oneness or the self-realization 
is the final stage, you know, and then after that, you know, you're done and you don't have to do anything else and, and so on and so forth. There's, and I think a lot of people kind of gravitate. That's not my experience. No, and I, and I don't know if it's anybody's experience, but some people seem to be able to sort of live with that for a while. Um, and perhaps it's a lazy man's sort of... It is. I would say it's the end of wisdom. End of what? <laughs> it, it's the end of the energizing the me story. Right. It's the end of that, but it's the beginning of walking who you really are, which is really like baby steps. Yeah. In other words, there could it's be a really there could be a vast a range of further development and integration and so Absolutely. on. Absolutely, right. and I I see that as, see that as endless. I see that as going on until the last breath, as Papaji said. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Vigilance until the last breath is not something that oh you've arrived and now you just it's like a, an ongoing moment-to-moment -moment awakening, mm -hmm. and there, there is still always going to be, as far as I see, in the body-mind, there are leftovers, things that still want to become conscious, yeah, and therefore, life comes towards you and it's manifested to become conscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, <clears throat> I mean, we we might be kind of making it sound like it's going to be a lifetime of just having to deal with your shit, you know, but there's, no. but, but there's the, ups <laughs> no, 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 there's the upside to it, which is that, you know, there's all sorts of glorious, you know, possibilities to be unfolded in terms of the, you well, know. the beauty, the beauty is there's no more work. There's no more work to do. You know, before it was like you were working on yourself, right? but after that moment, there's nobody to work on. It's just an unfolding happening by itself. Hmm. So you just sort of enjoy the ride. And the deep, yeah, it's it's just happening. You're the passenger in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's going by itself, and it's a deepening. And then the the deepening of the realization is greater and greater and greater freeing. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to emphasize that that, that, no that, it's, that the the freedom that there's a tremendous gratification and fulfillment in uh, as a as a consequence of all of this, uh, you know, um, un unwinding that's taking place. It's, so it's not yes. like you're just having to sort of, you know, work through all this crud. There's no more work to do. Right. There's no more work to do. Right. Because there's nobody to do it. Hmm. There's nobody to work on and there's no nobody to do the work, but there's an experience of being somebody in the world there's an experience, but there's there's no sense of me needing to work on myself. It's over. Mm -hmm. It's all over. It's the, the 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 miracle of life unfolding by itself. It's all happening just as we talk right now on this on this uh, computer. Mm -hmm. It's like, do you have any sense that you are actually doing anything right now? No. You know, there's just uh, no. It's kind happening. of a spontaneous. It's, it just rolls along. And it's going by itself. I, I got no idea what will be the next word and neither do you. <laughs> right. And I don't know if anybody does, but you know yeah. but there's you know right. it, commonly there's this is there's this sort of a notion that one is in control, you know. Right. When you really get this that this these words that are coming out of the mouth are, are happening by themselves, then there's a surrender of the the doer, the doing, or the one who even needs to control anything, because it's just a happening, right? Yeah. It's like a surrender. It's ego death. What I always find in my experience is is that there's just this a sort of a, a a paradox that's always there, which is not in any way a conflict. It's just the the nature of it, which which is that on the one hand there's you know sort of a impersonal non-doer kind of thing and on the other hand you know there may be volition all right i really got to get out and mow the lawn you know or or something uh and uh, no nah, i'd rather yes. rather sit here and fool around with my computer no nah, i got to cut the grass before it gets dark you know yes. okay i'm going to go do it yes. you know so and you know and i that's my experience too right and i pr i prefer this food over that food or this activity over that activity so there is a person who has preferences and probably will be again till your last yes. till your last breath uh, but on the other hand, simultaneously, yeah. there's nothing happening, and there's nobody there's, nobody to whom it's happening. There's absolutely unique. Exactly, exactly. There's a unique 
expression of life happening, right? Yeah. I like to, I like to smell certain oils and put them on my skin. I, I enjoy all these kind of things. Sure. You know, and you'd rather and do is, that than, than rub some kind yeah, of setup. stinky thing on your skin. You know, you obviously you have your preferences. Yeah. As a human being. I like to get massaged. To yeah. As much as possible, you know. Sure. I enjoy all these things, but many people they they don't want to be touched or massaged. Well, that's their problem. You know, so it's it's like yeah, there's absolute unique expression, and this is the beauty. Especially, you know, one of the things I I like to say is like um, now I can really be me. Yeah. Now, now I can really be me. Right. Fully. In all my little crazy little things and all my madness. Yes, you know, and I, I watch myself with all these funny little habits, mm -hmm. and they're hilarious. And I, <laughs> and I can really just be that without any judgment, without any idea I should be different or anything. It's just the freedom to be what I am at all the levels. Yeah, yeah. I think that the reason I brought that up is that in neo Advaita circles these days, there's sometimes an overemphasis on the absolute view, you know, the non-person aspect of it, to the exclusion or to the denial of of the personal uh, yes. and, and all. Like, for instance, I was listening to this yes. talk by a fellow named Jeff Foster, who's quite popular in those circles, and he was talking about how, oh, yeah, yeah, you I know, know, Jeff, he was talking about how he had been taking a walk with his mother, and his mother had said, look at the beautiful tree. And he, you know, went yeah. into this whole dry intellectual thing about how there is no tree and there is no person to see a tree and so on and so forth. And he said, looking back at that, he's, he was sort of shocked at how arrogant and how, how um, cold he was, you know, yes. and how, you know, there is a tree yes. just as much as there is not a tree. And, and it's, it's wrong. And it's, it's unbalanced to kind of emphasize one to the exclusion yes. of the other. It's like a way to say it would be like, it, it's like you step completely out of the play, but you're not really free until you come right back in the play of ordinariness. Yeah. And and if you can constantly beat the, beat the drum of there is no person, there is no person, to the exclusion of the fact that there also is a person. It's only halfway yeah, there. Yeah, then it's unbalanced. Yeah. It's a, I would say from my vision that's a stage, you know. Good point. And, you know, I notice a lot, and I'm not being uh, biased here, here, but I notice a lot in the and obviously not with you and many others but there are a lot of um, males in this um, expressing this that that want to kind of like go into the cave where nothing is happening huh. and it seems to be a more female expression where they come into the everythingness I went through that stage the fullness of everything right yeah. right it's a stage yeah, yeah. it's a stage and as we mature there's the willingness to come in and okay you're gonna experience now Whatever you're going to experience, mm -hmm. you know, because to come back into the, the the person, so to speak, it is like you actually agreeing to come back into all those sensations. Yeah, and you know, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately you know? is the fact that you know, when when you get right down to it, what we really are is we are the intelligence which has given rise to the universe, uh, and we're we are that. Um, living itself or expressing itself or experiencing life through a particular individual expression. You, you, you're Ananta, I'm Rick, and you know each of us is, is a unique expression of the very same intelligence. And you know, look at the universe. Yes, I mean, look at, look at how much that intelligence seems to enjoy creativity, diversity, beauty, dra drama. You know the whole fantastic, the whole catastrophe, as Zorba the Greek yes, put it. It's it. And uh, yes. and so yeah. you know that being the case, that being its tendency, our, our tendency, it's absurd to sort of want to sort of shut it down or deny it even exists. Um, you know, on some level that's true, but obviously <laughs> on a, on another very very significant level it's not true, and you have to sort of live that paradox. Absolutely, in absolutely. In fact, someone uh, recently I heard someone quote Nisargadatta as having said that a good measure of the, one's enlightenment is the degree to which one is comfortable with paradox and ambiguity. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and. It's like um, going so far away to find what, where it always was, right here, hmm. right here in, in the cup of tea. Uh, <laughs> yeah.
this this is it this is the miracle itself yeah. so uh so how do you and how, it, i'm sorry go ahead go on oh i was just going to say so you know you see, yeah i just you know you say that you you're doing you're still doing a lot of satsangs around Europe and this and that. Does it just sort of have its own momentum? People call you up and send you a plane ticket and and you know. Have... Yeah, for the last. Um, yeah. No, they don't send me plane tickets. I I buy the plane ticket, but usually it's like um, uh, people book before I fly. Mm -hmm. So there's a group of ten, fifteen people waiting when I arrive. Mm -hmm. And so for the last five, six years, it's been happening like that. How do you um, cover your there's, and there's, then, Well, then if there are 15 people waiting, then the payment they make covers the trip. I see. Okay. Because, my, yeah, my, my, expensive, my expenses are like um, the flying, the staying, the moving on to the next country, the beautiful, wonderful quality the of organic food that I love to eat, all these things right. are paid for by the participants. And it's, it's like, a, the way I see it, it's like an energy, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we move energy mm -hmm. and people pay in the form of money, which is energy. Right. And that, that pays for the things that I need to pay for. It's all energy, energy, mm -hmm. energy. Yeah. Do you uh, ever come to the US or ma mainly just Europe and Asia? I've never been to the States, but it's funny, since um, the Allen interview, mm -hmm. I've had so many questions and so many uh, suggestions mm -hmm. and a few invitations to come to the States, yeah. Oh, good. But I really, you know, I don't have a very strong, um, my body, my, my body-mind system is not the energetic type. It's like I, I need a lot of stillness, relaxation, and... I I feel now that I don't want to run around the world unless really it's like it's all set up and waiting for me. Then I would fly. Yeah. Hmm. You know, but I don't want to. I don't want to kind of go looking for or use energy I don't need to. Or, but I, I would love to see the states hmm. actually, if it happens one day. Yeah, yeah. I hope it does. Um, there's some beautiful places to see here. Yes, yes, I'm sure, and some amazing beings. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and nice cold weather. I've had hundreds of this. <laughs> you've you've had hundreds now of what? It's, now it's hundreds of mails oh. from the states oh, cool. coming in. I've been doing Skype sessions. Oh, good. Well, yeah. you probably get a bunch more as a result of this. Uh, yeah, we're having a big snowstorm right now in the Midwest. It's just this, you know, huge thing coming down, wow. and making big, it happens every winter. It's no big well, deal. Did you say minus 20? Yeah. That's with the wind chill. You know what wind chill is? It means, it, you know, if, if it's zero degrees and no wind, then it's zero degrees. But if there's a yeah. 20, mile an hour, 20 mile an hour wind, the, the equivalent effect on your body is as if it were, 20, okay. you know, X number of degrees below zero. Wow. So uh, in terms of your... Wow. Uh, your yeah, here, here it's like... Yeah, I'm sure it's balmy and, and wonderful. <laughs> Um, in terms of your, you know, experience now, I mean, since you seem to yeah. consider yourself to be a work in progress, um, what's going on? And, you know, what, what are your current, what's your current perspective on the changes you're going through and, you know, unfoldments that are taking place? Uh, yeah, the, the, the strong calling in me is more and more to settle, mm -hmm. to stop running around the world. You know, I've been running around the world for so many years. Yeah. And I'm still homeless, yeah. <laughs> Even though I found the true, right. The body does, does require certain things, you know. Mm -hmm. And I and I want to try to settle more. Mm -hmm. And so I'm here in Chiang Mai, mm -hmm. checking out, and giving a few open satsangs, mm -hmm. and seeing if this is the place for yeah. settle. So that my challenge is really about. Um, it's it's the body, like if I continue in the same way that I've been continuing, I'm just exhausted. Yeah. So yeah. it's really about me 
starting to just calm down, settle down, yeah, and let people come. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, the body. So I'm body looking has for that. that. Yeah, and it's not getting younger. This mm -hmm. is a reality. Yeah. Even though I feel younger every moment, you know, right. the spirit is always ageless. Mm -hmm. But the body asks for certain. Yeah, I went. I went through a stage where this is like 20 years ago or more, where I felt very detached from my body, and I would just work myself into a frenzy, and uh, you know, and and I don't know it was crazy, and I'd get these boils on my neck and strange, you know, seizures and, right. and you know tensions and all kinds of things. But I felt so detached from it that you know I kind of like kept pushing it you know and, and then you know i kind of finally realized that that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't the way to do it <laughs> it's saying hello <laughs> i'm here too <laughs> yes, yes yes this i am not the body it's like the body says hello you know i'm just going to break and crumble and you need me yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know without this moment is not possible yeah i mean consciousness and it's really my, my passion I'm sorry, what? It's really my passion to, to work with people and share this integration process. I feel that when we come together, it's really like um, um, an energy that's being created on the planet, you know? Mm -hmm. Like so many beings are sharing this now and more and more energy fields are, are um, opening up with uh, consciousness that Somehow the planet is is asking for that. Yeah, there was so even a, um, though the planet doesn't ask for anything, <laughs> it, it's showing signs a, of needing more consciousness. There's a story in the Puranas which you may have heard of, where there was this huge rainstorm in some village in India, and uh, a Krishna's village, and the the people all sort of called out for help to Krishna to save them from this rainstorm. So he came and he. He took a mountain and held it up with one hand over the mount over the village to shield it from the rain, you know. And then everyone thought, oh, you know, how can he hold up this mountain all by himself? And they all so they all got sticks and they and they put their sticks up to help hold the mountain. And uh, you know, they all thought they were participating. And but of course, Krishna, yeah. Krishna was really the one holding the mountain. And uh, you know, it's, it's like that. We <laughs> we uh, you know, there's this vast intelligence that seems to be percolating up. In, in in world consciousness today, yeah. and uh, it's it's just yes. it's just happening, and and we're like the people that are kind of holding up our yes. sticks. <laughs> you know, everyone is you know. Yes, and and it's a bit like coming coming like um, each being when that awakens in each being, it's like coming in alignment with 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 that that's holding it up because it is it is the same thing. You know, these people yeah. are the same thing as that which holds it. Up. Uh -huh. And and when you so become a like willing a participant, then you uh, it begins to use you and and you know and to and make you more and more yes. effective conduit for that intelligence. I, yes. I was watching an interview with Oprah Winfrey just the other day, and and she was saying that she was saying, "Use me until I'm all used up. That's what I want to do with my right. life." <laughs> right. You know who Oprah Winfrey is, right? Yes. And that's 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 the same here. Yeah. Yes, I've never actually watched any of her, but I've heard of her. Yeah, I haven't watched her stuff, but I'd like the most, to. Most kind of rich and famous uh, enter entertainment person in in America and maybe in the world, and, and she, you know, just has a huge impact on on what people think and do. And she just, fe but she feels like she's a tool of of some higher intelligence. You know, she often expresses that that she's just being used for a greater purpose, and she just wants to be as. Yes. Wants to be used, yes, used yeah. as fully yeah. as possible for whatever that purpose yes. may be. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. Yes, that that can be the experience of the personality. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, at, at the level of personality. Yes, it's, I feel like that. You know, let let it use me, and then at at the other level, it's like it, uh, only it is moving through yeah. this. You are, you, are the, you are the you are the it which is using you. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing there's nothing I can do otherwise. <laughs> right. There's there's nothing else I can do. It's yeah. really just this moment happened. And all this thing, work right. you've been doing all these yeah. years, you know, working on yourself, working out all this stuff, all this body work and emotional work and all that stuff. You you know you've just been making yourself a more and more it's fit, part fit instrument, you know. 
Yes. And it's also part of the sharing now, you know, because it's like I'm able to to meet people where they're at, in whatever they're at, in so many levels and in so many places, people that are coming off drugs, people who have caught up in whatever, you know, it's like yeah. whatever you've experienced through yourself, you can can really relate to in somebody else, right? Very good point. So you know, I'm able to use... Yeah, yeah I've, ac I've actually heard it whatever said by, tools I by wise teachers up, that, if, right. that if you, you know, I've heard it said by wise teachers that if you didn't go through all this stuff, uh, in a progressive way, you wouldn't be a very effective yes. teacher because you just couldn't relate to other what other people were going through. But it's made it's made yeah, it's kind of made a, a rich experience of of being a, being able to relate to so many different um, walks of life. Yeah, you know? yeah, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, what what a gift every moment. Yeah. Every moment. Well, you've... And now, in by the way, my in my world, there are no um, all the drug connections and all these things have long gone. You know. Sure. <clears throat> but if someone came to yeah. you who was involved in drugs, you would be able to say, oh, "Okay, you know, well, I've been there, and I, I understand what you're going through." But now, look, yeah. look at this. And you they know? have people. Come. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I and I see that most of the people who are like going into the drugs and all of this is because they want to get out of the mind. They want another, to know another reality mm -hmm. or they want to escape the pain, whatever. Yeah. And there's another way. And, um, you know, it's really a, such a rich blessing for me to be able to easily facilitate the direct realization of another way. Like to, my work is really about bringing people into the direct experience mm -hmm. not like just teaching something I know and they don't know yeah you know it's always I say you know in every being it's already known that's why when you when you read a book and you recognize truth there's something in you that recognizes that mm -hmm. because it's already known yeah good point so it's very very easy to, yeah and also so like when people hear truth they go that's it but what is it in them that says that's it? It's, it's already that truth itself mm -hmm. that, that hears it. And you know, almost everybody. So who, everybody uh, already is it. It's they are, and almost everybody who whom I've talked to who has had a, what we would call a spiritual awakening has had the realization that I always knew this. You know, I just didn't sort of recognize it, but I can so see they, now that it was there all it's along. Always, yeah. Just, Look in a baby's eyes. Yeah, yeah, good point. Look in a child's eyes. Mm -hmm. you know, really early. You just only see God looking out. Yep. That's all, you know. You have to try to tell them how life is, but they're like, they look at you like, uh, like, <laughs> they're just being aware now. Yeah. That's, that's all they're shining is being aware now. Mm -hmm. And you fall in love with that, you know, because it is, it is that love. Right. It's pure. But, and but somehow we have somehow we have to come full circle, you know, and, and uh, get go through all yes. of our teenage years and all this crazy and high school and all this yes. crazy stuff in order to sort of come back to it and realize it in a mature, more mature way. And to value it. Yeah. To value it. Mm. To value the 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 being itself. To just value that, you know. And when when we were Starting out, we never could value just the being. Yeah. We, we were, the mind wants something, right? That's why the mind starts chasing this thing called enlightenment or whatever, because it wants something. It doesn't want no thing. Mm -hmm. But this is the beauty. When the mind can relax, it doesn't want anything anymore. It's just being, being, being itself is everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we have the value of this being. I'm sorry, continue. Say it again. Value. Valuing this being. Right. Just valuing this. Mm -hmm. This is the only thing to give it value. I often say to people, you know, the only difference between Ramanam Harshi and you is the value you give it. Yeah. He gave it all the value and sat his whole life on, on a mountain, you know, and absorbed in that because he gave it the value. Right. And, and he knew how valuable it was. Um, 
And of course, you know, his, yeah. his experience yeah. was, was very and deep and profound and clear from a young age. But, um, you know, it's, it's a little harder for someone who is yeah. overshadowed and lost and confused to sort of value something yes. that they only dimly... But then that's what I say to people. It's like, right, I, I, say, I say often that I can show you right now where it is and what it is, is but can you value it, mm. you know? I, is there a valuing of that? Because if not, it's, it's, it, it, you just go straight to the next thought or the next uh, whatever. Mm. It's like you, to really stop in that for a moment, just stop and fall into that, just rest in that for a moment and see if it has any value. Yeah. And when, when you start to see that, you know, even when you're in pain, this is not in pain. Right. It gets some value. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> There's a place in you which is never in pain. I think that, wouldn't you say that the uh, the degree of clarity with which you experience it or know it de determines how highly you value it? I mean, if, you're, if, the, if the experience is... They come to part, together. Yeah, if the experience is very vague and cloudy and, you know, you just have this kind of remote sort of glimpse, then you, you, you might go running after the Rolls Royce or the you know the beautiful you know partner or something like yes. that and and yes. you know and not sort yes. of value and you will yeah but yeah you will until you get to the next disappointment <laughs> yeah and but in your case you know for instance when you <laughs> had that when you had that deepening in the prison <laughs> wave after wave of deepening and and falling into that then you you tasted it so mm -hmm. profoundly that you couldn't help but value it you know because it was it was v yeah. very I full I was very lucky. Yeah. I was very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything in, in the life for me has has and still does point to that. Yeah. Well, but I was very lucky to get a long period of silence and solitude. <coughs> yeah. And um, all, that, all that. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't escape, you know. Right. It's the only place to go. Oh. Huh. Interesting. Well, there'll be a run on the prisons after this interview. But I know that not <laughs> not everybody needs an extreme experience. I I see now that you know so many I meet that have been on the path of yoga or this or that or whatever. They've made themselves ready to come to a point of readiness to be able to just get like a little shift. Yeah. And then it opens. Right. Know? Yeah, I was I was listening to a fellow the other day yeah. talk about the distinction between the direct path and the progressive path, and you know the point he made is that the progressive path really brings you to the point where the direct path can happen. Um, as as someone said, there's a Zen saying that enlightenment may, right. enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practices make you accident prone. <laughs> I, I'm never sure. Enlightenment, what? I say that there's a Zen saying that say again? enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. In other words, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In other words, it makes this. It makes it likely that that it's going to happen. Yes, it's like prepare the ground and wait. Yeah. Osho always said, tether your camel and eight, right. you know? Which is, I'm glad we're saying this, because again, in, in Neo-Advaita circles, there's this premature emphasis, in my opinion, on giving up the search, you know? Don't do practices, don't see teachers, you know? Just give up the search and realize you're that. And, you know, that may be true at a certain point in a person's uh, progress, but if, it's, if, it's, if that attitude is adopted prematurely, it ain't going to happen. I mean, you, you can just sort of... Well, even... No, but even if you even if you um, attempt that, you can't you can't do anything about it. The search goes on. True. Even in giving up the search, is the search. You know. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> True. All seven. This is all the seven beautiful billion thing. of us are like on a spiritual you... path. Yeah, yeah. Everything, everything is part of that. Yeah. And it's just a moment of readiness, as far as I see. And, you know, grace reigns. Yeah. Good. Well, um, yeah. 
we've we've managed to somehow overcome the the technical challenges of having this conversation between Iowa and Thailand. Um, yeah. Is there anything that um, you'd like to bring up that we haven't discussed uh, that I haven't thought to ask or anything? Pretty much covered it. No, I can't think. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. And so people obviously will be able to get in touch with you and you say you're doing Skype sessions and, and so on. And so, you know, on, on batgap.com, I'll, yeah. I'll have a link to your website and uh, people can get in touch with you. you. Your email is there and everything. And, uh, you know, if they live in Europe, they might see you in person or in Thailand for that matter. And otherwise, maybe they can have a chat with you via Skype. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And uh, since Welcome. since you're in Chiang Mai, look up my old friend Bob Fickus. Uh, I told you about him. He's there. He has some little ashram with some little Ayurveda clinic or something attached to it. And he, he, oh, really? Yeah, go out and have tea with him or something. Ah. Does it ring a bell? What well, does he use another name also? He might. I don't know. Um, Ayurveda clinic rings. A bell. Yeah. Does he have a? I know an Ayurvedic place not far from here. It's um. He has a restaurant called The New Earth. He might. I don't know. I don't know. I'll uh, I'll send you a link to his website. Uh, and you can uh, check it out. <laughs> okay. We we were okay. we were on uh, course okay. meditation courses together from 1970 and onward for quite a few years. <clears throat> so oh, uh, wow. anyway, and and if you had contact. A little bit, yeah. I'm going to interview him one of these days. He 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 spends most of his time in Thailand and Japan, it seems, um, and he, he's sort of a spiritual teacher over there. But he, his oh. his base is in Chiang Mai. Oh. Okay. Well, let's conclude. Uh -huh. So uh, thanks a lot. I really okay. I've appreciated well, this opportunity. You. Yeah, thank you. It's been really nice. Yeah. Yeah, me too. So uh, let me just conclude yeah. by saying that uh, for people who have been listening, let me just uh, conclude by saying that, um, you know, however you may be hearing this interview, uh, there are about 50 of them now that I've done and a new one every week. And you can see or hear them all if you go to batgap.com, which is an acronym for Buddha at the Gas Pump. That's B-A-T-G-A-P dot com. And uh, there you'll find links to all the interviews that have been done and to the websites of the guests whom I've interviewed and links to podcasts and the YouTube and Facebook and all that stuff. And uh, it seems to be growing uh, every week. Um, next week I'll be interviewing Greg Good, who is fairly well known these days in uh, non-duality circles, has written several books. And uh, the week after that, I'll, I think I'm going to be interviewing a very interesting fellow. Um, who was some kind of a motorcycle, you know, biker guy, and <laughs> who had a, you know, a spiritual awakening that, that um, totally turned his life around. So I've been speaking with uh, Ananta from Chiang Mai, Thailand, and uh, I want to again thank you very much, and uh, both to Ananta and to my listeners, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.